QD's local talk program brought to you every weekday at 5 p.m. I am your host, Suki Wessling, and today I welcome three other KSQD hosts for a pre-election conversation in which I promise you we won't discuss any of the specifics of the contentious elections and ballot measures we're voting for locally or nationally. I'm guessing we're all a little tired, but we do want to talk about what what this all means. So our goal today is to bring you the perspectives of hosts who have interviewed a variety of experts on their shows on top of their own vast experience from professional careers to activism. We'll discuss American democracy and elections, where we've been, where we are, and where we hope to go. I'd like to welcome my guests. First, I'd like to welcome Ronnie Lipschitz, who is an emeritus professor of politics at UCSC runs, and runs the Sustainable Systems Research Foundation. Welcome, Ronnie. Nice to be here. Oh, of course. I forgot to pot up Ronnie. So here we as, go again. As they say, thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first time I've had multiple guests in the in the, the station with me, so so bear with me. Jill Cody's book America Abandoned: The Secret Velvet Coup That Cost Us Our Democracy explores how powerful forces intentionally abandoned democracy. Welcome, Jill. Thank you, Suki. And Christine Barrington, my co-host on Talk of the Bay, is a local community activist working for positive, solution-focused action. I am so happy to be here, Suki. Thanks for inviting me. We'll get to talking about a lot of different things, but my main interest here is to draw on what the three of you have been learning through what you have done in our community, um, in your careers, and especially through your shows from this year and from K-Squid shows in general, because I know that, that most of us don't have time to listen to every wonderful program on K-Squid, but there are so many things. So um, Ronnie's show, Sustainability Now, and Jill's show, um, Be Bold America. Be Bold America. <laughs> it just took me a second there to spit that one out. Um, have have really interesting, wide-ranging topics, as does Talk of the Bay. So the three of them are going to share what they have learned. And so I'm going to start by asking each of you to speak a little bit about your own um, perspective. So I'd like to ask you to tell the audience about your background, your show, and the types of insights that, that you hope to share today. So I'm gonna start with you, Jill. Oh, thank you, Suki. Well, I spent a lot of my career in the public sector and saw over the 33 years I was there, the, our democracy just slipping away. And it started with Reagan's uh, nine most terrifying words. I'm from the government and I'm here to help. And I was from the government and I was there to help. <laughs> and, but I saw a real shift after that. Uh, before those words were said, we were working with the community. We felt par a partnership with the community at public hearings and solving problems. After that, it got more and more contentious, uh, yelling, you know, I pay your taxes. So, it, you know, that led me to when I got when I was retired to write the book America Abandoned, the secret velvet coup that causes our democracy, because there are steps all the way through, and um, and my last chapter in the book is I'm waiting for a bold America. So when I was asked to do the radio show, I named it Be Bold America. All right. Thank you, Jill. Ronnie, how about you? How how has your experience, um, how do you hope to reflect your experience on, on in your career and also on your show um, today? In my career? Well, <laughs> I, I taught uh, global politics and global environmental politics at UC Santa Cruz for 30 years. Um, I stayed away from American politics because, you know, I think that's poison. But, uh, it can drive you crazy, It can yes. drive you crazy. <laughs> uh, but in the course of doing that, I became quite interested in, in particular, um, ethnic conflict, or what's called ethnic conflict, called ethnic conflict, 
um, particularly in Yugoslavia, which was happening as I started teaching here. Um, and actually, uh, I looked this up the other day. In, in 1995, I wrote a chapter about Pat Buchanan's declaration at the 92 Republican Convention and talked about the onset of civil war in the United States, uh, driven by the same kind of forces as in Yugoslavia. I mean, it's, and now, now we see this all over the world, right? So it's no, I, I get no satisfaction out of that. Uh, <laughs> sustainability now really does not get into those kinds of retail politics. Um, and the, the philosophy is that the, the best way to affect change is to do things locally and to try and get them replicated elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And so that's my approach. It's, it's, I haven't actually had any discussions about the political situation on the show. I was looking at the, mm -hmm. you know, the podcast today. Yeah. Well, and, and one of the things I want to talk about is how intrinsically tied up our climate issues are with with elections well, and voting and politics science. too. Science. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, if and, we don't have a democracy, we're not going to solve the climate crisis issue either. Yeah, so we'll get to that. Okay. I do want to ask Christine, um, how, how, what sort of insights would you like to share today given your background? Well, my background is that I'm an American citizen. I, what I consider a so-called ordinary person, I'm not a professor like my two distinguished <laughs> hosts here, but um, I have been watching our American democracy um, for the past 30-some years, so my early 20s. And I would say that I kind of have been very frustrated feeling that there was a way, a way in which America never really wanted to be a true democracy because it wasn't enshrined in our education system. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was really clear that if you want true citizens, you have to educate them. You have to train them. There was no more boring subject in school than civics and government. So uh, I meet citizens and they feel incredibly disempowered, discouraged, and shut down. Now, eventually, my professional training was in psychology. And so now I use my psychological and philosophical knowledge to leverage my actions to try to help people understand how to lean in. And the big question I've been seeking to answer is how do we make it enticing to get more people involved? Mm -hmm. If more of us aren't involved, it's all lost. So that I'll, I have ideas about going forward and okay. solutions going forward. Okay. And I want to point out that, that because it might sound, you know, on one side of the spectrum to say, get more people involved, really our democracy functions best when more people, no matter what their background, are involved, truly involved, and not just involved getting angry, but actually getting involved and getting to learn the Engaged issues. Engaged yeah. and creative and connected mm -hmm. and inspired and mm -hmm. empowered. Well, yeah. one thing that we end each radio show with is what we call the Keep Stop Starts, so that when we talk about a topic on Be Bold America, I ask my guest, what could the listeners keep doing, stop doing, start doing? Because apathy will kill democracy. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to start in the past before we get to our present and future. And one of the things that, that is really a big topic now, but I just don't remember being a big topic until recently, was this whole idea of, is the United States a democracy? Mm -hmm. Or in the words of some people, it's a republic, not a democracy. Mm -hmm. So, um, Ronnie, you want to take that one on? Well, I'll, I'll start with some definitions. A republic is a society that has no monarch. That's it, plain and simple. Uh, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea has no king or queen, has a dictator, but no king or queen, right? Um, the People's Republic of China. So that is the only thing that a republic, that qualifies a republic. Now, uh, if you look at the political theory around the uh, notion of a republic, there is also this idea of defining who is a citizen of the republic. What are the qualifications? What are the loyalties? 
And those, of course, are subject to uh, decision by the political process. So there's no reason to include everybody, okay? Um, democracy is, you know, the way we have a notion is that everybody gets a say. But of course, we have a representative democracy because a, an individualist democracy would be a very difficult proposition. Some people have said, well, with the internet, you could actually do this. You know, you could have everybody expressing their opinion and have plebiscites and things like that. Um, and, of course, the notion is you vote for the candidate who represents your interests. But what we really have is a market democracy, literally, one that is driven by dollars. You know that line of mm -hmm. uh, vote with mm -hmm. your dollar? Yep. Well, mm -hmm. your vote is worth a dollar. And if you've got a billion dollars, you've got a lot more votes. So, I mean, that's, you know, and so market democracy is usually to, talks about a democracy that has a market system, but ours is literally mm -hmm. a market. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so Jill, you want to take up on that a little bit? Well, um, I think today, you know, we're, we're a democratic republic. I think that they, they're fairly interchangeable. Oftentimes I hear, well, we're not a democracy, we're a republic. Well, we're a democratic republic. We don't have a monarch. We have a voting system. But so is the North Korea. So is North yes. Korea. <laughs> That's true. But how we define it here right. in this country. So um, I wanted to start way back in 1928 uh, uh -huh. for our history because there's a, I think there's some roots in um, it with Ayn Rand and somebody that she really admired that she thought was a wonderful and, and uh, free and light consciousness of wonderful spirit. And she based her uh, selfishness is good philosophy on this person. And his name was William Edward Hickman. And Will, William Edward Hickman, as she said in her own journal, uh, said that what is right for me is good. So there's the seed of greed is good. What is right for me is good. And she just, she further said that uh, he didn't understand the necessity or meaning of importance of other people. So thinking about the commons, thinking about helping others, wasn't in her um, um, teachings. So what, who was William Edward, Edward Hickman? He kidnapped a 12-year-old girl and ransomed her, demanded ransom from the parents, killed her anyway, but when he went to um, pick up the ransom, he tied her eyes closed and stuffed her so she would sit up in the car. And when he got the money, he pushed her out the door of the car and her father could see his child oh, on the ground. Horrible. This, and yet, Ayn Rand thought this was a wonderful man. After this happened, wow. Wow. after this happened, she still was shocked at how many people were repulsed by that act. Incredible. That's I am. So Rand. she is a sociopath. She is a sociopath. Yeah. yeah. In addition to him, mm -hmm. the thing is, is that one party has taken Ayn Rand as their muse, as their um, goddess, and 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 was the foundation of the Libertarian Party. Now, the Libertarian Party, um, David Koch ran for vice president of the United States in 1980 on a Libertarian platform. I won't go through the whole platform, but think about what's happening today when I mention a few things. He ran for um, abolishing Medicare, repealing Social Security, abolishing the EPA, the FDA, OSHA, and the FAA. I don't know how you land airplanes <laughs> that would by be that, but, but abolishing mm -hmm. it. And I think a lot of this, his next step would be you privatize all that. Mm -hmm. um, it's privatize everything, uh, roads, water, so on and so forth. Also was against the separation of church and state. No compulsory public education and uh, no government welfare, no aid to the poor. Now, does this sound familiar with what we're dealing with today? So here we've got Ayn Rand adoring William Edward Hickman, who gave the what is right for me is good uh, concept and uh, don't, don't worry about others. And here we go with a libertarian uh, vice president platform, all of these things, and today they still 
want to abolish Medicare, repeal Social Security, privatize everything, uh, destroy public school systems for a private school system, tear down the walls between church mm -hmm. and state. So then, um, I don't know if you want me to get into the well, Supreme Court so I can I'll just <laughs> no. leave that for later. Let's <laughs> just leave that for later yeah. because I wanted to, to bounce this off over to Ronnie because I know that um, the, the question of individualism and in in the the foundation of this country we have this this individualism but we also have a need for social order and clearly if they were all like if we were all like that hickman character it would be end times <laughs> but 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 so so how how in the founding of this country do you think that 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 was foreseen how did they see that balancing those two or do we even care about the founding of this country and what they thought? That's another question. Um, well, you know, I, th I think that um, individualism, or what you might think of as high individualism, wasn't, you know, nearly as prominent at the founding of the country. I mean, the thing, the idea about the republic is that there is a set of beliefs that, you know, unites the people and that basically drives their loyalty to the nation not to the state, but to the nation, to the people. Um, high individualism is a product of um, uh, liberalization and globalization beginning in the 1970s. Uh, and I mean, I won't go into the long lecture that I used to give, but <laughs> you know, the idea of have it your way manifests itself in, um, in the transformation of the market from a market of mass production to one in which you could have things um, produced with all of the bells and whistles that you want, right? Your personal preference. I mean, that was a reflection in the market. And that also was a reflection in society that the individual comes first. I mean, it's always been there, but mm -hmm. um, it's become uh, really very prominent. And, and the, the idea of the social order is that people uh, will not be uh, you know, subject to tyranny, but they will follow sets of rules in in the public interest in, and, in the idea of keeping you know keeping things predictable and sort of normal when uh -huh. you get individual high individualism you know and people are encouraged to do what they want uh then it becomes much more difficult to sustain a social order yeah and, and i want to get back to that because one of the things that that we saw during the trump years was a breakdown in norms, so-called norms, which are the uns unwritten, unspoken rules of our right. democratic process. And it's really being exposed why, what happens when people don't keep up those norms. I know, Jill, you wanted to say a little bit about a couple of Supreme Court decisions that inform what we're going to talk about next, which is where we are. So go ahead. Well, it starts with um, an attorney named Lewis Powell. And he wrote, Lewis Powell wrote a memo, or it's called the Manifesto, at, that really presented, uh, he presented to the U.S. Uh, Chamber of Commerce. And he, in his memo, basically, he said that uh, business was being emasculated and victimized by, and perpetrated, and this victimization and emasculation was perpetrated by the federal government. So this is sort of the roots of deregulation. Because back then, there was 175 lobbyists in, in uh 1970. And now there's 15,000. And when you start thinking about uh, how many people are in Congress right now, <laughs> 535. 535. Yeah, and those 15,000, so divided. many of them were yes. part of our government before they became lobbyists. Yes, too. but the, the pressure that is on them. But that's the seeds of the deregulation. And what just to explain again a little bit George Lakoff's point, in that regulations, what are they? They're just rules. And you wouldn't play baseball game without rules. You, uh, you wouldn't play football game without rules. You, you don't play the game of capitalism without some rules that protect the people because corporations are so much uh, more powerful. And if they really were a person, even though they're looked at as a, you know, legally as a person, if they really were a person, they'd be a psychopath because they don't have any humility or empathy or compassion. So. Um, we need rules to protect us, but there's been a long, decades-long uh, effort to take to destroy the rules that protect we the people. But then Richard Nixon appointed Lewis Powell onto the Supreme Court, 
And uh, no one knew about his memo when they appointed the Supreme Court. That happened afterwards. I think uh, the reporter was Jack Anderson. But it ha after his appointment, saw where he was coming from as in pro, such pro-business. So the very first uh, Supreme Court decision that Lewis, when Lewis Powell was on the court was in 1976. It was called Buckley versus Vallejo. And it was the first time money was given free speech rights. That made money free speech. Now, I have not heard my money talk to me from my pocket, <laughs> but, they, but money now has free speech rights. Then, again, Lewis Powell's still on the court. In 1978, another uh, decision, Boston uh, versus Bellotti, and that's where corporations got uh, free speech rights. So the march is on. Then in 2010, we're pretty much aware of Citizens United, uh, and that's where the Supreme Court, based on those two previous decisions, no limits on the amount of money you can spend on, because now you have all this free speech and money, there's no limits on what you would uh, spend on that. So in, in, the, in, in talking about personhood, just a second, personhood is something that's, that the courts based their decisions on, that corporations have personhood. That was based on a head note in 1886 on a um, court case that was actually the Santa Clara County Railroad, um, Southern Railroad decision. And it was a head note that a uh, court reporter named J.C. Bancroft Davis wrote. It wasn't ever a decision by the Supreme Court, but that head note turned into people are, the corporations are people, my folks, my friends, I think that was a quote. And then the last one that's not as well known is McCutcheon, McCutcheon versus FEC. And that's where individuals got to spend unlimited money. So we have free speech, we have money becoming uh, free speech, then we have corporations have free speech, individuals have free speech. So today, whoever has the most money, individual or corporation, has the most free speech, mm -hmm. unlike the four of us in this room. And therefore okay. it's not free speech anymore, is it? That, no. It's right? bot speech. It's for. bot speech. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so so let's get to let's tie that into the internet in a minute. But I want to um, go back to the question of how that change, the change that that corporations got rights that re were rights that humans had, goes along with this idea of the norms that you were talking about, Ronnie, and and the way that that it was assumed that people will behave in a certain way. What has changed? Because, I, you know, when, when we look at when the four of us were younger and we look at the parties of that time, lots of things were really different. Like, um, you know, people actually voted for, say, to confirm a Supreme Court justice. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was confirmed with unanimously, wasn't she? There was like one person who wasn't there that day, something like that. So and to, to now, so that's one norm that has changed. The way that presidents are behaving, the things that they're doing, those norms are not being looked at. And also the way that, that voters are considering their own uh, their own part in this democracy is changing. So so what do you see happening between when we still had norms and and these basic societal rules that we were following and now what's what's been happening? You know, we call it we call it the culture wars. Um, and and that is the politicization of beliefs and values and turning them into basically threat, existential threats. Um, Nixon was really sort of the progenitor of this with his, with his strategy. What was it called? You know, the strategy of frightening voters with visions of, of uh, you know, burning cities, basically, yeah. right? Um, and uh, it's, it's sort of come from, gone from there. But, you know, I mean, in the 1950s, it was communism. Communism was part of the sort of mortal and existential threat to the American beliefs and values. Um, it was just not, I think, as weaponized as, it's, as it has, that difference has become. And now you've, you've got um, significant portions of the country essentially believing that the other part of the country 
poses an existential and mortal threat to their way of life. I mean, you know, using that broad broad term. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are, there are economic underpinnings to this. Uh, there are religious elements in there, obviously. There are ra- there's racism, um, and there are other kinds of, of pernicious, you know, pernicious belief systems that are driving this. Uh, and so, well, I, you know, I've, well, <laughs> I don't know where to go from there, except well, you, that, that um, I, I don't want to over, you know, estimate the sort of comity of politics in the 1960s. All right. I think that's a, that's a mistake to think about golden ages. You know, mm-hmm. there never was a golden age. It's just that certain things didn't stand out the way that they do, they do yeah. now. And you, you use the word weaponized. So, you know, everybody loves to bring up these examples of the past when some politician behaved badly. Look, they, we aren't, they aren't so bad now. Or some, there was some corruption that was so awful. Look, it's not so bad now. But the word weaponized, I think, is, is getting at what is happening. How would you describe the difference between someone who just is a good politician who knows how to, to say, hey, are you scared of the crime in that, that city over there? Vote for me, versus turning that state in, into a weapon. How, how does that happen? It, it goes from, from basically, I think, I think the pro- process is that it goes from uh, a, something which is a, a policy, a public policy issue, right? Is if there's crime, what is the solution? Well, you know, it can be throwing more people into jail. It can be hiring more police. It could be um, counseling. It could be rehabilitation, right? But these are, and, and these are, these are uh, debatable questions, right? Which one works? And this is what, what academics collect endless data about, you know, what works and what doesn't. Um, but when you start to say that, or to think that these tendencies, you know, it could be crime, it could be race, it could be religion, are not just, are, are modes of theft, right? They're modes, they're existential threats to my continued sort of living the way that I'm accustomed to living. Mm-hmm. And they may also be physical threats. And politicians can play on that fear. Fear is an enormously powerful force. Right. Right. Yeah. They can play on that fear. Then people will say, okay, you know, I'm willing to accept these kinds of, this kind of violence to the, the, the normative practices that we once engaged in. Um, and, and that turns it into something like a weapon. I mean, I'm not sure I like the term weaponize. It's just... It's become very popular, mm-hmm. um, but it, it it's is become trying. inflamed. Yeah, yeah. It, it is trying to distinguish what's being done now, and I think you're you're distinguishing policy versus just scaring people is is important here. Yeah, let's talk about that. Um, so again, my training is in psychology, and um, I always love FDR and how he had the courage to say that we have nothing to fear but fear itself. And yet these Republican leaders, or let's just say the people in our culture who are constantly telling us we have so much to be afraid of, it's infantilizing. People should feel insulted that they are being told that they should be so frightened of every single little thing. Now, um, when, when you ignite, it's very easy to ignite the fear centers in the brain, okay? Um, our brain is biased toward the negative. So as soon as you put something out there with a certain intention and a feeling, it, it, it doesn't even have to make sense. It just has to have a certain quality and feeling. You and certain topics, right? So Jill just had an amazing guest on her show a couple of weeks ago named Bryant Welch, a psychiatrist and a lawyer. He wrote a book called State of Confusion, Political Manipulation and the Assault on the American Mind. And he said something um, really powerful. He was focused, the book is intended to focus on the instability of the American mind as it struggles under trauma and political manipulation to, and, and how that 
um, impacts the psychological burdens that we need to maintain democracy. So the things that he spoke to so eloquently is that it's really easy to knock people off as soon as you bring in questions of sexuality, of identity. It hits these primitive fear centers in the brain. They are very, very ancient, and they knock our prefrontal cortex Mm -hmm. offline like that. And as soon as a person is destabilized with these kind of like primitive feelings they think they're thinking but they're they're actually behaving instinctually and and you can be led by the nose so easily once you are destabilized true leaders inspire people to think to tolerate paradox to to remind people that human beings are extraordinary we have amazing strengths we are we can handle things and um, they inspire us to reach for the best inside of us and to be led by our values and not by our fears yeah and I wanted to add that anyone um, because one of the things that that I have done a lot about is writing about research on on child development and teaching and um, anyone who's ever had a teenager in the house will know exactly what you're talking about because teenagers have their brains are developing their prefrontal cortex is not completely developed and and if you make them fearful in any way they go straight to that place and then they start saying things that are completely illogical this really smart person that you know who's really thoughtful starts saying things like i know you hate me and and that's because you've triggered that, mm-hmm. that fear center. It's and, called the hippocampus, yeah. and it's actually a portion of the brain, or called the lizard brain, and well, it that's turns the off amig- that that's the amygdala, amygdala. Yeah. but it's all in there, because the hippocampus mm-hmm. is how we tell stories about ourselves. And then it yeah. stops the higher order brain mm-hmm. from, from um, mm-hmm. activating. And another thing that's happened is, remember, there used to be days years ago where a handshake was a contract. But that was based because people had values. And uh, you were talking about norms, but values and principles centered. And one thing on Be Bold America is that we talk about that there's a crisis in politics that can't be ignored. But we also have a crisis in acceptable character uh, that, and, and also principles set of leave it, a living that can't be ignored, mm-hmm. too. And, right, I, and, you know, I think that it's really important um, at this point to bring in the question of the Internet because... When this country was founded and throughout most of this country's history, if you were going to go stand on your soapbox and and um, exercise your freedom of speech, or if you were going to print a pamphlet and exercise your freedom of speech, and even more, if you were going to run a newspaper, um, everybody knew who you were. You were a person. Right. You were a physical entity, and people, your neighbors, would say... Hey, I saw you in the town square talking about, are you okay? Is there something I can help with? Mm -hmm. And we don't do that anymore because we have the internet. Right. Um, Exactly. And, you know, bringing up trauma and character. So a very important book was written many, many years ago called Achilles in Vietnam, Combat Trauma and the Undoing of Character by Jonathan Shea. So what he he was a physician who ended up studying trauma because he saw the breakdown of character in many American GIs. And he tracked the story of trauma back to all the way to Homer and Achilles and how Achilles went berserk when Agamemnon took his concubine. And um, and what he saw was that at the heart of trauma is betrayal, particularly when you feel betrayed by those mm-hmm. in authority over you. And I will say, and I think Jill will agree with me, the American people, the average American person, many of the people in these blue states I feel we're tremendously betrayed by by the people in power in this country and left behind. You mean in the, in the red states? In the I'm sorry, okay. in the red states. Yeah. Thank you. So in the heartland, um, my little yeah. dyslexia. In the heartland, <laughs> left behind and th- traumatized, and and now there there's this undoing of the being, and we have we are not being led by our greatest values, and. I think that that's going to be our way forward, which we'll get to later. Okay. So I am, oh, hang, hang on one more word from Ronnie, and then we're going to take a break. Right. I mean, the, 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 the way in which this is characterized is, you know, I followed all the rules. I did what I was told to do, you know, social mm-hmm. order, mm-hmm. and look where I am now. Right. 
Left behind. Yeah. yeah. Right. You are listening to Talk of the Bay on KSQD. We will be right back. All right. We are here with Talk of the Bay, and this is your host, Suki Wessling, and I am speaking to... Three wonderful hosts here at KSQD about the state of our democracy, where we've been, where we're going, and what we're going to do about it. Mm. And, you know, it is unbelievable how fast an hour goes when you're having a really great conversation, because Mm -hmm. now I'm looking at the clock thinking, oh, we don't have enough time. Mm -hmm. But we do. We are going to talk about some, from here on out, we are here. We are stuck here in the present as much as um, one of my favorite things is um, time travel movies. Uh, We are stuck here in the physical world and we are four individuals living in a place that that things are going pretty well. We have our challenges and our community has its disagreements but sometimes I feel like Looking at the rest of the country, I think, well, here I am in my little cocoon, and it's awfully nice and comfy. And even though, you know, I think obviously we we have a ways to go, we also, I know a lot of people here who feel powerless. They feel like, oh, well, I'm in this place. I don't know what I can do. So let's talk about what we can do from locally, because we know that doing things locally really does affect everywhere else, to what we can do um, outside of our area. So Christine, I'm going to start with you. First of all, I I want to say there is so much we can do. There is no reason to ever feel empowered, but I do disempowered. Disempowered. Thank you. I'm like doing everything in reverse tonight. There's no reason to feel disempowered. Just why we're here. We're here okay. to help. But I want to recognize that people most people that I speak to feel disempowered. And so, uh, and that's intentional, by the way. People need to know it's intentional. It is intentional. It's part of the system. And so, one of the things um, that uh, Bryant Welch talked about, right, was that when you are getting this onslaught of traumatizing information in the news, um, all these terrible stories, your system starts to disorganize. And as a psychotherapist, I can say that's exactly what happens. So, the medicine is we need to organize and Internally and practice what I call inner activism. Okay, so I'm really talking about how we learn to nurture and nourish our system directly in response to our political world. Okay, so we tend to practice self care um, in other parts of our lives. And I want to say we need to bring that right into the heart of our political activism by organizing internally, absolutely refusing disempowerment because that's a form of a trauma coping response it's a freeze we do not have the luxury of cynicism okay and so i try to encourage people first of all to understand that all of us need to lean in and the first thing the way that we lean in is by not collapsing internally Mm -hmm. and and feeling we can do something. And then the next thing is to ask yourself, if I did get involved, how could I do it in such a way that it would energize me and it would nourish my being? So for some people, they're like, I'm not interested in writing letters to my reps. I'm not interested in standing on a corner with a poster. And I'm like, great, there's a million ways to get involved. But try to know yourself Mm -hmm. and ask yourself, what nourishes my being? And I can talk a lot more about this, but I know these other two have have more to say. And um, so I'm going to stop it there and pivot. Well, I'm going to I'm going to build on that a little bit, too, Mm -hmm. because you talked about um, what nourishes me. And one of the things that that I have been trying very hard to do is thinking about what I call media hygiene. Mm. So um, just like if I'm, you know, I, I'm thinking, wow, I'm, I gotta smell something here. I got to take a little care of, you know, the, 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 the body that I'm in. I look at the media I'm consuming and I decide, is this what I need? Mm. And so I, I think it's really important for people to remember that whatever media they consume it's the it's a tool 
It is. It does not own them. So Facebook, for example, there are things I love about Facebook. And the reason is because I have used my media hygiene and I have gotten rid of all the pernicious stuff. That includes someone who I was friends with, who I agreed with politically, but whose posts were toxic. Mm. They made me so angry. And I would feel my you know, my heart beating and I'd be like, oh, that makes me feel so angry. And so I feel like that's that's also something that is part of what you were talking about, Christine, to get yourself in a place where you can take positive yeah. action mm-hmm. because you can't do that when you're in that if negative you're shattering your nervous place. system, yeah. you can't take positive action. So organize internally, take care of yourself, and then begin to organize pods around you. And I can say a lot more about this. We can't get into this now. And so I'm thinking one of my early shows in January, we might go into this in detail. I have a lot to say about this. And and because it's all about organizing. Chaos is entropy. And the medicine for entropy and the entropy in this country is to organize. And it starts internally. Then you move out to your inner circle, to your city and the nation. And... It's the inside out. You do have to start from the inside out. And I look at it as that there's four really components that we need to take care of, if not every day, at least within a week. There's that physical side, so we need exercise and eat nutrition. We know that part. There's the social emotional, which is the part of this. This is this is great um, uh, social emotional battery charging, having a discussion like this, but also going out and having date night or whatever that that does you know increases your battery potential. Then there's also uh, the mental. You know, you've got to take care of your mental. Um, Uh, capacities too and start thinking are you reading books are you on talk shows are you challenging yourself and then there's the spiritual Mm -hmm. and however that is whether you go to church or whether you you're reading something of a hot that uh, that inspires you Mm -hmm. so to take a look from the inside out uh, are you addressing all of those things at least within the week and I wanted to say something about cynicism because a lot of people are uh, cynical right now and cynicism is the wound of the heart of the heart and if you know that that's a wound of the heart, you can start repairing your heart. You can start saying, okay, um, I, my heart's uh, uh, damaged because of, of this situation in the country or, or um, uh, the ideology or whatever it is, get, is you're cynical about. But then once you realize, you can start mending that heart right. and, um, and realize that you don't have to be cynical anymore. And I think actually this disempowerment is the end result decades after Ronald Reagan saying the nine most terrifying words are I'm from the government I'm here to help because that was intended to separate people from their government and their country yeah and and so I wanted to bounce this to Ronnie because Ronnie you have a foundation you that um, and what you're doing is not related to your your political uh, being a political professor background directly. But can you talk a little bit about what you're doing and why? Why are you spending these years doing this rather than kicking back and, and you know, watching it, football? It's not a foundation. It's a nonprofit. It's a nonprofit. Know? Okay, and, and I, I copied it. Let's not worry about foundation. the name, right? Okay. Um, what I, the reason that, that um, I and some colleagues launched this was really frustration with trying to do things at the university and encountering a bureaucracy that essentially made it extraordinarily difficult, unless, of course, you had lots of money. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, so our idea was that we could uh, pursue projects outside of the university. The bureaucratic, you know, connections would be much smaller, and we wouldn't be confronting this kind of skepticism. What is the name of this? The Sustainable Systems Research Foundation, right? uh, and so uh, what's what our, and our idea was that and, you know, we're focused on the environment. Right. We're not trying to save the world. Tra- saving the world, which is really what so many people want to do, <laughs> is a very difficult proposition. You're, you're going to feel really? like a failure no matter what. Well, well, I mean, you know, people look for silver bullets. Mm-hmm. Right. If we only do this, we will save the world. And and it's too complicated to do that. So mm-hmm. our philosophy is that you pursue social, socially-based projects locally 
and try and and uh, set them up in ways that can be replicated elsewhere and scaled up as necessary, right? And so it's a kind of a bottom-up strategy. It's it's um, you know, do we have enough time to do this? Hmm. Right? Can we succeed? Um, but so it's it's rather than trying to to uh, orchestrate from the top, right? You know, mm-hmm. and and I wanted to say something about you know res- responding to Christine that this also if if you go out you know listeners go out and they're not already doing it to start working on local projects and it doesn't actually matter what it is mm-hmm. but working with other people in the pursuit of right. certain kinds of goals you know that builds social relations and uh, so what's so important in our you know cognition is those social relations because those are the social relations are what make us who we are absolutely Uh, and well said yeah you know and so i mean that's i think uh, really important and And maybe seek out not your siloed social situations but those that may not think the same as you do well if you get involved this is the thing like like if you get involved in a local project Mm -hmm. say for instance my understanding is the Republican Party in Santa Cruz does a beach cleanup every month. Well, you can go take part in that. Mm-hmm. Or, and and yeah. rub and, and you never know what will happen. Any kind of caretaking of this region, you will bump up against all kinds of people. And very positive things can come from that. So I always say that the quality of the relationships that we have with one another will determine the quality of the outcome we are trying to create. And so for me, our one of the, our ways forward as a nation is constantly seeking ways to build quality connection. And um, there's so much that can be said about that. Um, and talking about also outside our locality, there are amazing national organizations that if people feel disempowered, they could plug into that can really change things like the Ranked Choice Voting Organization. It's a national movement. It is well run. You can plug into that. And if if Ranked Choice Voting was implemented across, across the nation, we would have a much better chance at real democracy. Represent Us is trying to get money out of politics through using local ballot initiatives. Very well run organization. Um, and Braver Angels. I don't know if anybody's heard of Braver Angels, but their sole purpose is to bring uh, red and blue individuals, people that identify on opposite ends of the political spectrum into listening, caring, respectful conversation. And there's much, much more. There are so many ways that we can plug in. Yeah. And, and, you know, I'm looking at all three of you and pretty much everyone here at K-Squid as doing something just like that, even if they're here just spinning tunes. And that seems like, well, what's that about? That's not doing any sort of positive social action. But of course it is. Because anything that you do where you reach out to your community, and that's, you know, coming back to my obsession, the internet, so many people no longer interact face to face with other people because you don't have to. You don't even have to go to the grocery store anymore. Mm, Suki. Yeah. Um, there's a story that E.M. Forrester published in 1909 called The Machine Stops. Yep. And it's essentially about mm-hmm. what happens, you know, when the internet breaks down and people have to leave their pods <laughs> and and deal with each other. I mean, it, it's very prescient. You, you can get ways. it on Audible for free. Ooh, yeah, it's okay. available online. So, so yeah. I d- will have a um, podcast page on ksqd.org for this. And if you are listening out there, don't worry. You don't have to write everything down because I am writing it down, and I will put it on that page, links and everything. Um, you know, of course, we have limited time here. And I wanted to ask each of you, um, as a host, to recommend a show or two that you really think that someone who's interested in this might want to seek out on the K-Squid site. And like I said, these will all be linked on the page. But I'm going to start with you, Jill, to, to ask you about, you know, a show or two that you've done that you really feel will give people a sense of perspective and a positive feeling of, yes, I can make some things happen. 
Well, Christine mentioned one that was on my list, which was State of Confusion, uh, when I interviewed Dr. Bryant Welch. But another one was um, our state houses being weaponized by David Pepper, who was uh, chairman of the Ohio Democratic Party. And I think that was that's one I can recommend. And then the one I did last night uh, with uh, former KGO radio host John Rothman, uh, uh, titled uh, Nice Democracy You Got There, Shame If Anything Happened to It. <laughs> that was a great title. <laughs> did, was, did you come up with that I one? I did. I yes. love it. I got, that, I got that on my inbox and I laughed. So, so I have more on my list, but uh-huh. I think those are a couple mm-hmm. of good ones. Okay, Christine. Okay, well, I'm going to name two, but actually, because I don't do a lot of uh, political stories. So one I'm going to name is one of Jill's shows, which was the United about the United States of Distraction, mm-hmm. Media Manipulation and Post-Truth America by Mickey Huff and Nolan Higdon. And the reason I would recommend it is that book that they, first, it's a great show. And Mickey's hilarious. Thank you, Christine. And, <laughs> and they talk about the fact that in this book, they had a big, long, juicy chapter at the end about what you can do and they said they had an incredible response to that and I want to uplift that and say that I believe we need to spend a much bigger proportion of all our communication on solutions so in that vein a show I would recommend that I recently did was interviewing Delton Chen of the Global Carbon Reward and he's an individual who sought to find a solution on how to fund climate mitigation and and came up with a brilliant plan. I'm not going to go into it, but if people look up Christine Barrington on Talk of the Bay, you'll see my shows. Well, and Mm -hmm. and I'm going to link to it on the podcast Mm -hmm. page for this show. Mm -hmm. And Ronnie, go ahead. Um, I did a show uh, a few months ago with a a law professor at the uh, University of San Francisco, and I think the title of it was Some of My Best Friends Are Elephants. Uh, and the idea is <laughs> is uh, personhood for animals and for natural <laughs> features, right? Mm-hmm. Which is is appears in in the courts, and I think, you know, that's not something. I, I mean, it has obviously things to do with how mm-hmm. we treat people as well. But but the idea that the world is not a means, the world is an end, is really important. Mm-hmm. I think, and I think it's important politically too that mm-hmm. we we don't treat other people, we don't impugn other people's character, mm-hmm. as I might say, we're doing here in Santa Cruz. I know you said we wouldn't mention it, but I'm awfully tired of seeing these dueling editorials in the Sentinel mm-hmm. where people accuse each other of mm-hmm. being evil. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right? mm-hmm. yeah, and that that has that's another topic altogether. Yes. That is something mm-hmm. that I've seen more in Santa Cruz, which was really shocking to me. Mm-hmm. But we are going to end on a positive note. I want to say thank you so much to Ronnie Lipschitz, uh, Jill Cody, and Christine Barrington, three hosts here. Please look up their shows. They're great. Great. And we will see you all again tomorrow. Chris Crone is our Talk of the Bay host for Tuesdays. Have a great evening, everyone.